And just like that, you're over three and a half thousand miles north of where Tristan said goodbye to you now on a windy, windy day apparently in Juma. And you're with me, Stefan Vinterboer and Senzo in the world famous Masai Mara. And in particular, a portion of the Maasai Mara called the Mara Triangle. And surrounded by us is a selection of animals that you'll find at Juma, just slightly different in every single way. There in the distance, we have some zebra and some topi. That brown antelope that you're seeing is one of the world's fastest antelope. It's, it's Africa's fastest antelope and is rivaled only by the pronghorn deer in North America as being the, the second fastest antelope on the planet. And there you've got that black and white unmistakable zebra profile. Coming into the foreground, we've got some East African impala. Slightly different to the impala where my friend Tristan is busy driving around in, in that these impala have two growing seasons and are therefore almost in a constant state of a testosterone overload and are a little bit bigger. Their horns are much bigger, their bodies are a little bit bigger than what they would be down there. And then in the foreground, right here close to me, we have a sounder of warthog, which are very similar in actual fact to, uh, to those that we find out in Juma. Isn't it just amazing that we can skip so much distance so quickly and we can show you what we're showing you in two almost completely different environments. Now I'm just as interactive as what Tristan is so don't forget that you can ask me your questions and please do ask me your questions and, uh, and let's chat about this wonderful technology that is being brought to you from this, the southern end of Kenya and the northern end, if that makes any sense, to the wildebeest migration. Now there's a bit of a misconception around wildebeest migrations because the general perception I had when I was growing up was that the wildebeest arrive and they spend a couple of months in the Masai Mara and then they go away and this place is left absolutely devoid of life. But that isn't true at all. What happens is there's two distinct groups of animals. There's those that migrate away and there's those that stay and are sedentary. And there's a lot of animals that stay. I would say many tens of thousands of animals stay. And they do so because the Masai Mara is, although not as good as the Serengeti, is a very, very good place uh, nutritionally to stay. Not only is the grass good, they have two growing seasons, and we don't really have a winter or, uh, or a dry season here. And so the grass pretty much grows all year round here on the equator and allows for a lot of herbivores, and those herbivores then attract a lot of uh, predators. Um, the wildebeest, of course, do migrate. They are migratory species, and what they will do is go where the grass is best. And that happens to be in the southern, uh, southern portion of the Serengeti, which is in the northern part of Tanzania, if that makes any sense, and a couple of hundred miles away from here where volcanic ash uh, and high rainfall and direct sunlight and wide open plains make it possible for wildebeest numbers to explode in dramatic fashion. And that is what we're waiting for right here. We're waiting for the wildebeest to arrive. Those plains started to dry out about a month or two ago. And as they started to dry out, there's no permanent water there. The wildebeest started to trickle away from the Serengeti and started to be funneled by the hills in this area. And they will be funneled into this particular particular portion of Kenya into this particular portion of the Masai Mara Game Reserve. And, uh, and they'll spend three or four months here enjoying the grass and as soon as the rains start over the Serengeti again they go all the way back south again. And they do this annually and it's in a cyclical motion. They don't, not all of them go along the same route but it's roughly circular uh, and a couple of hundred miles uh, in extent. Now what are we going to do today? We are going to be heading out in that direction over there, far away, let me just see if I can get my bearings exactly where I want to point, right there, so let me see if I can get my finger there, and there around about, there is a pride of lioness, and they have with them some cubs, and I'm hoping that I can find them for you before you leave us and the end of the show today. So that is what the plan is today. Oh, 
James, you've asked me if the Impala, the East African Impala, make the same deep rutting growl that the Impala Juma make. Absolutely, it is almost identical to the one, and I'm actually hoping that some of these male Impala, this bachelor herd of Impala that you see here, will actually do that. Now, the females are all pregnant, and they all harremed together, and all being attended by the strongest, biggest male out of the selection of males in this area. The rest of the males will hang around Around in a group called a bachelor herd they will not be allowed close to the females and they will wrestle with one another the youngsters learning how to fight and the older uh, less competitive rams are busy giving the youngsters some lessons in fighting so they complement one another absolutely they look after each other the older rams allowing some security and then also as their senses start to fail the younger rams will start to uh, basically look after them. It's not quite that simple, but basically look after them. What you're looking at there is some posturing. You've got two males of roughly the same size doing some lip smacking at one another, facing each other. What they're doing is they're showing each other their horns. They then turn sideways and profile their bodies and they tense their muscles and they try and put their bodies against the skyline. They'll fluff up, fluff up their tails and they try and look as big and as intimidating as possible. If the two males are of the same size, they will fight with one another and you can imagine horns that long and that sharp can inflict the most terrible wounds. And quite often in the rutting season, when those males are making the deep rumbling roar, they will be fighting with each other and to the death as well. It's not uncommon to have impala with puncture wounds into their chest cavities. Just have a look at that. Isn't that just a magnificent display of male East African Impala? All with their muscles tense. It's almost like, um, I suppose, a bodybuilding competition. They're all trying to not fight with one another by showing each other how big they are. And there, one turns sideways, a bit of lip smacking. There's some profiling. Now have a look at the tips of his horns. You're looking at the last inch or so of his horns. Male impala that are, are ready to breed, in other words, the prime males, their tips of their horns, the last inch of their horns are parallel to one another. Male impala that are too old to breed, horn tips are facing away from one another. And male impala too young to breed, their horn tips face toward one another. All of them have those ridges and those ridges are there to stop the horns from sliding past one another when they're wrestling and inflicting unnecessary injury. So those ridges are pressure ridges. The horns lock with one another. The male impala strain and stress and press against each other. Those horns create friction on those ridge edges and basically stop the horns from sliding past one another and letting those absolutely sharp tips slide into a body cavity when it's not absolutely necessary. Of course, they can push past that with enough force and male impala quite often do. What I'm gonna do is just freewheel down the hill and see if we can sneak up on these impala a little bit, get them, get them a little bit closer to you. Don't forget, send some questions. Can't only be one question out there that you wanna ask. Let's see if we can get some more. Now, why are there so many herbivores on the slopes of these hills? Quite easily to explain. It's because the slopes offer shorter grass and protection from lion. So lion enjoy valley floors and they do not enjoy the slopes of the hills and as you can see we're on the edge of an escarpment here. This escarpment is called the Olulolo Escarpment and is a feature within the Great African Rift Valley. It isn't the valley wall itself but it's a feature within the Great African Rift Valley. There's a lovely shot there from Senzo on those ridges. You can see those pressure ridges on that old male. You can actually see where they've been rubbed rubbed shine, uh, rubbed shiny from all the years of wrestling with one another. Old ram that. All right, I hear my friend Tristan has also got an impala to show you. And so without further ado, you heading all the way south back to Juma.